Um, and let, let's start with the dovish case. Give us the playbook for that first. Okay, so the dovish case isn't really that good. And I'll give you a preview of the hawkish case. Like, that's not really that good either. So if you think about what's a, what's a dovish case? A definitive pause, patience with getting to 2%, terminal rate of five and a half, no chance of rate cuts. By the way, no chance of rate cuts no matter what. So I would just say take rate cuts off the table. That's not like part of really dovish. They're just not out there, I don't think. So what's behind that? What's behind the dovish case? Why would they get dovish? Because the consumer's weakening, because corporate earnings are slowing, because the economy is under control and it do, it's not showing robust growth. So what's behind the dovish isn't really that great. What that would say is, if we're at $220 earnings on the S&P 500 right now, and expectations for 2024 are 240, and that's 12 plus percent earnings growth, a dovish case would say, hey, good luck getting to that 240. That's hmm. gonna be really hard. So a dovish case isn't that great. Okay, interesting, because most people would assume that's a knee-jerk positive. Right? I guess we kind of know the Not answer <laughs> in advance then if he's hawkish, but I'm curious if you could walk us through this scenario as well. Okay, so a hawkish case. Um, so in a hawkish case, we have, oh, look at this. Sorry, this is my first time with the Telecaster. We have really strong language on 2%. We have stubbornness of inflation. We have a need for more tightening. And in that case, the terminal rate would be six to six and a half percent. And and let's like the way we said, what's behind that? What's behind that? That means that rates are gonna be higher. They're gonna be higher for longer. Inflation's not coming under control. That's gonna take money out of the consumer pockets too. So like behind that, isn't that great. So while we could see earnings actually grow, right, because the economy is still too hot, what those high interest rates do is they say, hey, valuations are kind of capped here because there's a remarkably precise correlation between inflation and the valuation of the S&P 500. So if you have higher inflation, no one wants to pay 20 to 22 times earnings. And if you're only gonna, and if you're gonna have a market that's higher from here, you need to either continue to pay 20 times earnings and have earnings grow to 240, or you need to pay 22 times earnings if they're gonna stay at 220. So both of these cases lead you to a market that I don't think, a broad market, an S&P 500, that I don't think has too much room for upside from here. Interesting, okay, I know that it, it's not like you're not buying anything though here, so what kind right. of stocks you do? You can always buy something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's, so there's always a bull market somewhere. That's right, who said that? <laughs> um, famous guy. So. Um, so first of all, if you're an investor, you don't reposition your portfolio. Hopefully you've had your position, your portfolio positioned like we have for years in advance, where if the market's kind of meh, which is what we're expecting, you know what you do? You chug along, you're well positioned, then when eventually a bull market comes along, a broad market, bull market, you participate in that upside. But how do you get through this? It's with the stocks that are either irrationally low valuations, non-cyclical, growth delivering, being able to deliver growth regardless of the cycle, and right now, international too. Hmm. So in that case, you've got like really low valuations in our portfolio on VF Corp, which we just added, which is down 80% from its high, trading at 10 times earnings, down North Face and Timberland. It's basically just overly discounted the death of the consumer. So even if the consumer is weakening, the share prices move way, way, way more than the reality of that. Hmm. Or Cisco Systems, which reported earnings last week, it's trading at 13 and a half times. It's like the cheapest tech stock there is. And their earning growth is really great because whatever technology is out there, you need Cisco's systems and they're growing. So those are kind of like irrationally low valuations out there. Very interesting. Want, how, how do you know? So in, and maybe you just give it, you know, make sure that you're not in a value trap. I mean, this is the quintessential <laughs> question. Okay, but the value trap, like that's a whole separate conversation on the research process and the due diligence and understanding what's actually behind it. Is there realistic earnings growth? What's the free cash flow like? So that's just part of the research process. Because when you run a screen, you can look for things that are just a low valuation and you're gonna get, I don't know, 1,500 companies spit back, but maybe only 100 of them you find investable and maybe only invest in 30. So the research process calls that out, but it's hard work. All right, before we let you go, give us one more. You mentioned VF, you like Cisco here, anything else? Okay, I think on the non-cyclical, this is a really interesting place to be too. So you could look at Ventos, which is a real estate investment trust that invests in the own, sorry, um, retirement communities. Or you could look at Organon, which is a, um, a healthcare stock that has a lot in mater um, maternal, um, sorry, in, in uh, what, I, I'm jumbling my words, sorry, in fertility and female health drugs. And that's yeah. very counter-cyclical, really undervalued, 
decent little earnings growth ahead. I still remember that. Who was a spin out of Merck or something? I remember a couple of exactly. years spin back. Exactly, spin out yeah, of Merck absolutely. a couple of years ago. And so it's been in that di in that like spin off no man's land for the last few years, which is why it's so under the radar. Totally, and a, a great point, Jenny. A lot to think about uh, tomorrow from Pal. You know, he whatever he says, maybe female health fertility or whatever is <laughs> is a place to hide. Uh, <laughs> Jenny Harrington, thanks for sticking around. We appreciate your time today. Thanks. Uh, Jay Powell, by the way, isn't the only one speaking from Jackson Hole tomorrow. We've got two big first on CNBC interviews. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester and Chicago Fed's Austin Goolsbee.